Johan Diaz, VP and Deputy CTO of our API management and integration at WSO2, who will talk about building APIs in a cloud native era. Hello, Johan. Welcome. How are you? Hi, Aaron. I'm good. How are you doing? I'm fine too. Uh, can you try to share your screen? Yes. Okay, can you see it? Okay, yes. Stop presenting. We hear you, we see you, uh, we see your slides. And so the stage is, you, is yours. All right. Thank you, uh, Aaron. And uh, thanks everyone for joining this session. My name is Nuan Das, and uh, I work as a VP and Deputy CTO for the API management and integration space at WSO2. I'm also the author of the book. Um, w, uh, microservices security in action which was launched a couple of months ago um, by many publications and um, yep that's me in the picture I lost a bit of hair since I've taken that picture some time back so I'm here to talk about um, building APIs in a cloud native era and I think it's a very timely and interesting topic because I've come across a lot of customers uh, who are um, either moving to or have already moved to the cloud. So we work very closely with customers who, um, and a lot of other people who basically are building strategies to move their uh, IT services to the cloud. And I'm pretty sure that all of you who are joining us today um, are in an organization where you are either working on or at least considering moving your IT infrastructure to the cloud. And it, this is a, a general pattern we are seeing all over the place. And it's not just our observations. And even, even Gartner predicts by, by the end of next year, like 75% or more of the mid and large organizations uh, will have moved to the cloud or at least have an IT or have a, have a hybrid IT strategy. Um, so when, when, when you talk about moving to the cloud, there are actually two aspects of, of this or, or several aspects of this. Um, probably the most common or popular one is about moving your infrastructure to the cloud. But today I'm here to talk about a little bit of more interesting aspect of this where you offer services on the cloud. And when we say offering services on the cloud, that basically means building APIs for different types of consumption. So you could build APIs for external consumption. For example, if you want to develop uh, or, or release a mobile application for your customers, you'd want your APIs exposed over the internet, over the cloud. Uh, if you want to, um, uh, uh, invite other people to come and build applications on your organization services, you'll have to build an API and expose it. Um, and in the same way, you also need sometimes need the APIs to be exposed on the cloud for even inter internal um, uh, reasons, like for other departments, other teams, and so on. So I'm today I'm here to talk about that aspect of it. And in that context, I like to see APIs as a means of connecting systems together. So there are various definitions for APIs. So the word API stands for application programming interface, but uh, uh, there are different interpretations of this. But in today's context, in, in the context of this session, I like to see APIs as a means of connecting systems together. And interestingly, APIs that you build today on the cloud, especially the ones that you are building on the cloud, are also built by connecting systems together. So rarely do we see an instance of an API that is standing on its own, isolated, and not connecting to other systems. That rarely happens in today's world. An API almost always connects to several uh, different systems. So I hope everyone joining uh, me today um, has some kind of an engineering background. Being a developer, uh, if you're a developer right now, or if you're an architect, or you may, be, you may have done some development or engineering work in the past, uh, so that you can understand some of the examples that I'll be taking. So let's look at a very simple example of, uh, of such an API. So imagine that you are working for a retail organization and wants to uh, develop a, a microservice uh, for processing orders in your, uh, in your organization's uh, retail system, right? So if you look at a simple order uh, processing microservice, this is what it will look like. So you'll simply have a very um, small code basically audience from your database and returns a, a successful response. But this is a, a, a too simple example. This is almost non-realistic and order processing API would uh, be a lot more complicated than this. 
to, so to make things a little bit more interesting, let's look at a slightly realistic use case of this. So in a realistic scenario, what will happen is something like this, where uh, to process the order, you need to connect to other different systems uh, for uh, fulfilling its functionality. So an order cannot be processed until you know the, the payments are done, and you would, uh, and for that you would need to integrate with uh, some kind of payment system like Stripe, for example, which offers its services um, over the internet uh, or as APIs. And once an order has been processed, you probably want to send a notification to to the customer uh, through through SMS or through a WhatsApp message saying um, that that the order has been processed and they can expect the shipment in in several number of days and so on. So to fulfill these kinds of requirement, you need the order processing API to connect to different uh, kinds of systems like this. And this is done through APIs in today's world. So Twilio has APIs that are accessible over the internet that can help you to uh, send um, uh, SMSs or WhatsApp messages and so on. In payments and so on. So this is a, a slightly bit of a realistic example of the order processing API. So if you are the, the developer who was responsible for implementing this order processing API, what you would typically do is um, you would go to the, the, the Twilio developer portal, figure out how to use the API and, and Stripe's uh, developer portal likewise, and um, write the bit of uh, pieces of code that are required for processing this uh, functionality. And so this is an example that I took took from, uh, from the Twilio's developer portal or from their send SMS API. Uh, so this is a piece of code that I took from their uh, Python SDK. So if you uh, observe this uh, piece of code, so this is a si very simple piece of code that they have uh, provided um, uh, the, the, based on their Python SDK. So if you look at these two lines uh, on the top, you can see that uh, we first have to initialize the uh, Twilio client using Twilio credentials, using our Twilio accounts credentials. So you get the credentials, which are the account SID and the uh, authentication token required for the endpoint, and you initialize a client first. And the next step, you uh, use the function in the client to send the actual SMS. So through this function, you basically send the SMS. So it's pretty simple, as you can see. So uh, lots of people who offer APIs on the internet provide these kinds of SDKs that make it simple for developers to consume their functionality. Now, if you take a closer look at the Twilio API that provides this functionality, so this is again an example from, from Twilio itself where they have uh, given a sample curl request which you can do uh, to invoke the send SMS uh, API. So what you see on the bold here is the Twilio API's URL. Uh, and you can see the payload, uh, which is in URL encoded format, where you send the message um, in this form. And uh, finally, you see the uh, credentials being sent uh, as a basic authentication header to the, to the Twilio endpoint. So one interesting thing to observe is how Twilio has um, gone about with the API versioning strategy. So you can see a date here, which is, by the way, way dated way back to 2020, uh, a decade ago. So it seems like Twilio is using a date-based versioning format for the APIs. So you can use this to get an understanding of what uh, Twilio's API is about. So as you can see, again, it, it seems to be pretty simple um, and easy to use. So you can use these codes, or you can use uh, code from their SDKs, uh, or you can even build your own, write your own piece of code if you understand the API properly to send, um, to invoke the Twilio's API to send an SMS, right? But <coughs> Uh, I have some bad news for you. So that was only about the happy part, right? No matter how great your API could be, could be the greatest API on the earth, there is all there are always uh, lots of unhappy parts that we have to deal with. So let's take a look at a closer look at what are the things that we oversee or did not did not pay a closer attention to when we were looking at that piece of code. So if you remember. We talked about getting the credentials from, from Twilio, embedding it into our application, and uh, sending it over, which prints it pretty simple when we were talking about it. But when you want to put this API into credit, uh, production, or when you're even thinking about the development process of it, you come across a whole lot of complications that you have to deal with now. And if you take a look at some of these things, uh, the first 
uh, step that you had to figure out is how do you get these credentials? So the developer who's implementing this particular piece of code needs to figure out um, how to get the credentials from Twilio. They either have to create their own account, um, but more realistically, since they would be writing this for their organization, they'd have an organization account and, and they'd have an organization's credentials. So the developer has to obtain these credentials from some place. And the developer has to think about how to store these credentials next, right? Um, in, in the code that you saw, it was a simple matter of getting it from the environment variables, right? But that doesn't work in real life like that, right? You have to think about how you're going to store it. You can't obviously hard code it in your program. And if you, if you can put it in some kind of storage, like a property file or, or even a database like thing, but you can't do it uh, in plain text, you need to encrypt those details because it's sensitive information, right? And if you're using, if, if this code is running on a platform like Kubernetes, you can possibly use Kubernetes secrets, right? So there are lots of complications like this that you have to uh, think about is to use this piece of code for real. And another problem is how do you, uh, once you figured out, uh, you also have to think about how can you propagate this through CICD pipelines, right? And also things like how to handle application errors. What, what have, what, how should I uh, write the code uh, when the phone number is invalid or when the phone number has been disconnected, right? How should I, uh, what should my behavior, the behavior of my code be when the credentials are invalid? How to handle network connectivity issues, right? Uh, how to handle a scenario where the API has been retired, right? Because I, as a developer who's developing this, I don't, probably won't pay close attention to um, Twilio's uh, evolvement, right? I, I probably won't pay close attention to their, uh, the, the, the API lifecycle and so on, right? Um, and, and even issues related to certificates. So there are so many uh, instances like this. These are just a few examples uh, where we have to deal with uh, in addition to making that code work functionally, right? So the problem with these kinds of systems or like the drawbacks of having to write code to basically connect uh, to these kinds of systems are many, right? So we'll go through a, a short list. Like first and foremost, it requires you to write lots of boilerplate code, right? The, the, the developer has to deal with error handling, credential um, uh, management and so on, which involves lots of code um, that are basically outside your business domain, right? So the developers need to learn and understand things outside their business domain, which is the process of uh, programming the order processing API. They have to learn how to use the relevant SDKs. And even in that case, you're lucky if they provide an SDK of the programming language of your choice. And if not, you basically have to implement it by yourself, right? And you have to learn how to manage credentials securely as we discussed and so on. And all of these learnings increase the risk of, risk of mistakes that developers do. Imagine the situation if some developer programmed these credentials, um, hard-coded these credentials in an insecure manner or used an uh, improper encryption mechanism, weak encryption mechanism for it, right? Uh, it would potentially risk your organization heavily. If someone finds your organization's Twilio credentials, right? They can spam all of your customers with different kinds of messages. And developers basically have it to keep up with the newer versions of the endpoints and so on, right? And imagine where you have three such applications being developed by three development teams in your organization, right? So each of these development teams now have to figure out how to use this, uh, the Twilio credentials, how to use the, the, the uh, how to do error handling and all of that, right? So these are some drawbacks of having to write code to connect to well-known endpoints or well-known APIs, which are a huge number, uh, by the way. So if you look at all of the endpoints available on the internet, you can basically run a complete business based on these APIs instead of having um, to set up anything on-premise today. You have everything from email services for, to, to things like Salesforce, uh, Conquer, and NetSuite for handling, uh, um, for accounting stuff and, and lots of these things available on the internet today, right? So you basically have to build uh, very less. So to solve this problem, uh, we have a thing called integration APIs, which are basically 
responsible taking on responsibility for these kinds of integrations so in a in a typical um, uh, architecture or a, or a microservice stack this is what a typical microservice stack uh, would look like uh, so you would have what we call as the utility apis uh, right on the right so these utility apis are the atomic apis that execute individual business logic such as you know putting stuff into the databases and uh, so on and then right on top of that you have the integration apis which are responsible for connecting to different systems and creating the integration to fulfill the functionality of your api so consumers would typically come in through the integration layer of apis and then uh, the integration apis would consume utility apis and so on uh, but that doesn't always have to be the case in cases where you can expose direct utility apis uh, to the consumers you can do that too so let's look at some characteristics of these integration apis and how they solve uh, the problems we have been discussing right so some important characteristics of this uh, integration apis is that are that um, the, the the tools that you uh, have to implement and the integration is support a low code or no code based mechanism so that itself takes care of the biggest problem of developers having to write lots of boilerplate code doing the same thing over and over and over again right and it has to be flexible enough uh, to be extended using code as well so one of the challenges or, or drawbacks of uh, especially no code platforms is that uh, they are not flexible enough to exercise your creativity right so the easier it gets the lesser flexible it becomes so it needs to have a nice balance of you know a low code versus the 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 the, the code uh, mechanisms to be able to extend uh, the 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 apis to fulfill your needs it needs to have all characteristics of proper cloud native microservices right things like atomic execution so instead of putting this integration logic into monolith servers like esbs it should have the capability of running those integration apis independently and in an atomic fashion they should be lightweight in distribution and resource utilization right so these are some of the characteristics uh, that are important and one important aspect again is that it needs to have a rich family of connectors to well known endpoints right so the integration tooling uh, that you are using for this needs to have a good set of connectors right and uh, not only to well known endpoints or apis it not also needs to provide value for connecting to any random endpoint any http endpoint because you have to do certain certain things when connecting to any endpoint irrespective of whether they are well known apis on the internet or not right and you also need rich constructs for doing things like data mapping so for example you need to get in the details of the order from the incoming request of your client and extract some of that data uh, and send it to stripe for for billing purposes right so you need uh, smart data mapping capabilities like this so <clears throat> these are some of the characteristics that you need uh, to build this integration apis instead of writing um, writing code right so so when i talk about this one of the questions that i get back mostly is isn't this what a service mesh does right and the answer to that question is no and the reason being so the service meshes are built for a very specific purpose so in a microservice architecture uh, you have lots of microservices talking to each other right instead of functions being built into one big monolith you what you do is you uh, remove those functions and implement them as separate microservices and as a result of that what happens is you end up in a situation where there are lots of service calls going from microservice to microservice so when that happens you have a, a new set of problems to deal with which are problems related to discoverability of those services problems related to resiliency like what happens if a microservice is temporarily un unavailable right things like circuit breaking and so on so service meshes deal with the problems of the the transport level or, or network level connectivity uh, issues that come in a microservice architecture it does not deal with the application layer uh, problems that we were talking about so far right so that's basically why uh, micro uh, service meshes are not an answer to this problem so so i just wanted to sidetrack a bit to explain why 
uh, service meshes are not an answer to this because that's a common uh, question that I've been getting. Now, so getting back on track, we now have a functional API that works. Can we put this into production? Right. So again, I have a little bit of bad news, which is to say it's not yet ready for production because there are still a set of significant uh, amount of problems we haven't solved. So one of the problems is, so although we built the API, we haven't secured it yet, right? So when you're building APIs in a cloud environment, it's extremely important to think about the security protocols of it. One reason, of course, being for you know security reasons, and also the other reason being uh, for it to be integration friendly, right? So when you're building a cloud system, as I mentioned in the beginning, APIs are supposed to be connecting systems together. So to connect systems together, you need uh, protocols and mechanisms where uh, your API can be easily integrated with, you know, like single sign-on flows and so on with other systems, right? So if you select proprietary security protocols and so on, it becomes pretty hard for other systems to integrate, right? And uh, we know that most of us have accounts all over the place now these days on GitHub, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Google, and so on, right? We, we simply don't like to create any more accounts, right? So uh, that's the same for your customers as well. They don't like to create accounts all over the place. So when you're building an API and offering it as a service over the cloud, it's important to think about how you can federate the security and grant access to your customers uh, through the accounts that they might already have. Right, and also about propagation of those security uh, contexts to the my backstream uh, uh, upstream microservices. Another problem is that uh, these APIs, uh, when, when you're in, in the cloud, you have to do quite fre frequent updates to your systems, maybe because of issues, maybe because of customer requests, and so on. And to deal with this complexity, you need uh, to kind of uh, separate out your clients from your actual microservices. So you need a system where you can upgrade your microservices and your APIs without impacting your clients. And to do that, you need a separation where you can keep changing uh, these systems behind the scenes while your clients are not impacted, right? So we haven't solved that problem yet. And uh, we also need to understand that now there are different types of APIs and protocols out there in the market. If you look at major uh, API providers on the internet, like, like Salesforce, like even GitHub, we see them, them providing uh, different kinds of streaming APIs and eventing APIs that we can integrate with and build really powerful systems. So it's so uh, HTTP-based uh, request response APIs are still the most popular APIs out there in the market, but we see a huge rise of such eventing APIs now, which uh, makes, makes it possible to build very, very powerful applications. So we need to, to be thinking about those as well. Um, and, and one of the other most important aspects is these APIs need to be automatically tested. So if you've seen, uh, for example, uh, Postman Web, so they have a, a very uh, powerful capability in terms of Postman Web where you can you know, create and run all of your automated tests for your APIs um, on the cloud. So that's one uh, such example. And also we need to think about how we can support hybrid deployments where we need to run certain parts of it on the cloud, certain parts of our API on premise and so on, right? So to solve this problem, <coughs> we introduce the final layer in our architecture stack, which is what we call as the edge APIs, which are usually uh, running on API gateways. So uh, this stack completes our architecture and uh, solves the problem that we have been discussing in this context. So you have the utility APIs right on the Right, the integration APIs uh, connecting to different systems and the edge APIs basically facing your clients. And then you have the control plane which basically controls this entire stack. So to give you a, a slight expanded version of the control plane, so most, uh, most often when we talk about API management and, and a control plane, we uh, always refer to the part that controls the API gateways. But in reality, you, know. you really, interrupt you we are on time unfortunately oh, okay uh, so there are some questions on the stage i think you can answer to them on uh on the chat uh All and right. people may in still interact with you uh directly uh thank you very much that right was that was my last slide so uh, thanks yeah. thanks all for joining and i hope this session was uh, interesting and useful to you
Thank you very much. Thank you, Nuan. And now we are welcoming François Rivard, CEO of Astrakhan.